Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? Are you ready to learn something new? Who's ready to learn something new? Just raise your hand. Cool. I see a lot of people who like to learn something new. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for showing your willingness to learn how to refactor your application to React to one. Before we start our session, I would like to ask you, no, I would, I encourage you and I call for take your phone, calling you to take your phone, open your browser right now, let's do it together, open your browser and enter that link or just scan the barcode on the screen. It will help us to make our, our presentation really cool. And we will chat during the whole, the whole, whole session and will make our demo session really interesting and impressive and interactive. So while I am preparing your phones, I will introduce myself briefly. Here, here will be the link, the same link, and it will be on the screen during the whole, the whole session. My name is Oleg. I'm from Ukraine, from Kyiv. Um, I'm a software engineer, almost as similar as you, focused mostly on distributed and cloud system development. In term, I'm a speaker. I love to speak. I love to preach reactive programming. I love to preach reactive system. I do my best to create some impressive and interesting talk about that topics. In turn, I'm open source guy and love to improve open source project. And I love Project Reactor. By, by the way, raise your hand if you heard. Raise your hand if you heard about Project Reactor. Cool. There is some people. Amazing. So. I do my best to improve Reactor by sending commits to that project, and I do my best to support everyone who, who is interested in, in that project. So if you have some questions regarding that project, you are open to, I'm open to answer it. In turn, I do my best to improve my local community. I am, I'm taking a part of uh, such big com conferences in Ukraine, like GE Conf. In turn, this year we will have Delox Ukraine, so you are welcome to visit us. And I do my best to improve my local community by creating and colliding Java user group, local Java user group in Kyiv. So that's a brief introduction of me and what we are going to do today. What our agenda? Today, we will first learn non-reactive application because non-reactive application is a good source to refactor it to reactive then, right? And the main goal of, of our today's session is achieving the system which will complain which will be compliant with something the picture on the screen. By the way, who knows what this picture means? Just raise your hand. Oh two people. For those who don't know what is it, it's reactive manifesto. And this picture describes the schema, the basic foundation principle of reactive system. And we will build the system which will complain to that manifesto and that basic or fundamental principle. And in the end, we will achieve something like following. We will achieve that the system which will build on top of reactive, non-blocking flow, natural flow of events. And that's our main goal. All right. That's cool, but that will be in the end. First, we have to learn non-reactive application. And our domain will be chat application. That chat application has really simple functionality. First of all, we will take messages and depict on our own UI from Gitter chat. So other people who use Gitter, just raise your hand. Cool, a few people. For those who don't know what is Gitter, Gitter is absolutely similar application like HipChat, but mostly concentrated on GitHub. And Jitter loves GitHub and allows you easily create your chat around your open source project. So we have a room here in Gitter chat and we will take messages from, from the chat room and display on our UI. In turn, we will have some additional functionality like calculation of statistics. Particularly, we will calculate the most active user and the most active chat, the, the most active user who is chatting in our chat room. And we will calculate the most popular, the most mentioned user in that chat room. So that's our functionality. And 
I will show you. I will show you that that UI, and you will. And I will ensure that this is that application. So again, here is the link to our chat room. I, I encourage you to to enter the chat the chat room using your, for example, Twitter or GitHub account, and chat with us. So, here is our application. As you may see, one one guy has already been sent the messages, and this is really working application. I will just show you. I will open my client here and buy something. Cool. Do you see it? It works. So this is our main application. It On the top, it has some additional calculation of most active user. It depicts the most active user and it depicts the most popular user. For example, if I mention someone in the chat, for example, let me do that. Yeah, I mentioned someone in the chat, so you may see that I mentioned someone, and that someone becomes became the most mentioned people in that the most mentioned user in that room. So cool, it works. It just works. It just it just does the main business. It just brings the main business value. So let's be back to let's go back to our presentation and let's try to understand what is going on behind the scene. Right? That's the most interesting part. What is going on behind the scene? First of all, the toolkit, the toolkit is really simple. Our application is built on top of Sprint Framework for other any Sprint developers in that room. Oh, amazing. I have a lot of Sprint developers in that room. In turn, for communication between client and server, we have Sprint WebMVC. Other people who use Sprint WebMVC in your project? Yeah, cool, amazing. In turn, we use a Sprint data to communicate with database, and finally, to smoothly run our application, we use Sprint Boot 1.5. That's our toolset. It's really plain toolset, and I believe you are using the same toolset in your project. In turn, architecture is almost similar to the toolkit, and really plain and uncomplicated. We have really plain three-tiered architecture. We have a client on one side. On the other side, we have a Gitter, which is the source of the messages. And in the middle of our schema, we have our application, which contains controller layers, server layer, service layers, and persistent layers. It's really plain, simple architecture, the most common architecture in the, uh, in the Sprint projects, in the Sprint application, Sprint-based application. So, Next, I will show you and ensure that we have this plain architecture in our project. Here is the EDA, which is open at project. And as you may see, here we have the controller layer, which contains controller, which returns the, our UI, the HTML with UI. In turn, we have some rest endpoint, which returns some important data, like updates about new messages. Here we have some polling mechanism. We just easily take some new messages from the Gitter. Then we update our history in the database and prepare some response for in turn toward the request. In turn, in turn we have some domain objects which depicts the structure of our database. And along with that we have some communication with database which which is mono repositories, and we have some service layer, some implementation of the business logic, like communication with Gitter, which is based on most common communication, based on REST template communication, and we have some business logic for calculating and updating statistic. That's it. That's our application, and this, it just works. Along with that, it's important to understand what is going on in terms of execution flow. And I'd like to explain it in the next slide. When we enter our application, when we open our browser, we call the index page and it starts collecting the important data like the, the latest messages from the Gitter and we have to wait, of course. Then right after that, we have to store that messages in the database and we have to wait again. And we have to update, obviously, st some statistic because of updating the database. And we have to wait a bit again. 
And right after that, only right after that, you will be able to aggregate all the data and send it in as a response of, of, of the user's request. In turn, we have a small JavaScript in our UI. We have the JavaScript which pulls messages every few seconds. And it, the, the pulling will do almost the same, the same action as it does, as it, as it uh, went in the previous case. So it pull, 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 pull new messages, and that's it. So this is our application. And in general, it's really plain application, everyday application, which has three tire. It's really plain three tired architecture and really plain common interaction flow between client and server. In turn, it just works. So what, what's wrong with that application? How do you think? From my point of view, the main problem with that application is pooling model, which might be explained as the following. Mom, mom, mommy, mommy, mama, mama, mama. mama. What? Other new messages. <laughs> and our application may, may be just empty and we just pull and pull and pull in for new messages and that is just redundant action. And okay, it's fine to have a pollen, but when we have a lot of clients, it becomes mom, something mom, like that. It becomes like a chore mommy, mommy, of pulling. And that's really, really bad. In turn, the more awful point is blocking IO. And the blocking IO is a pure, pure evil because it's a pure wasting of the resource. And instead of reacting to the event, instead of sending and then reacting to the response, we send in the request and block, blockingly wait for response. And then pure wasting of the resource. And finally, our application is non-responsive. For example, if something went wrong with our database, for example, as in that case, we will stop our database, our application become unresponsible like that. And that's really bad because it's bad user experience and this, and this show that our application is unreliable in terms of communication with external services. So it's another pro problem that we have to fix. And the question, how to fix it? First of all, we have to refactor our design, design of application. We have to react to events instead of blockingly wait. We have to react on anything. In turn, we have to, to move from pooling model to push model. We have to push messages from the very beginning to the very end. And we have, the we have to have a push model in our application. And finally, to be responsive, which is the main value of any application, we have to isolate our components, our application from the external dependencies. And we will do that in the next several steps. And first of all, the main question, how to be reactive? And the answer is really simple. To be reactive, we have to rely on new reactive Spring framework, especially on new reactive Spring Web Flux, which is almost similar to WebMVC. I would like to start with a small recap of what is Spring WebMVC. And as, it might, as you may see on the screen, Spring MVC is plain, plain project, which is based on building the code based on declarative API using controllers, which is, which is, powered, by, which is powered by Spring WebMVC, which is built on top of Servlet API and runs with the, with the support of Servlet containers. In turn, Spring WebFlux is almost a similar application and almost a similar project, which is built on top of declarative API using controller request, controller request mapping, which is powered with a new Spring Web Flux model, which is built on top of asynchronous communication with the network and rely on new asynchronous API like Server 3.1 or Netty, which is a synchronous server or undertow. In turn, the core project, the core model of new Spring Web Flux is Project Reactor. And this Project Reactor, you may build the code like that. By the way, other people who are familiar with Java 8 Stream API, 
So if you know Stream API, Java 8 Stream API, you will be able to read that code and you will be able to be build the similar things with a new project reactor. And what, and what you have to know about project reactor is two reactive types. The first one is Mono. Mono allows us processing one or zero element asynchronously and non-blockingly. In turn, the second type is Flux, which allows us processing unlimited amount, potentially an infinitive stream of elements asynchronously and non-blockingly. In turn, all this stuff is based on new reactive stream specification, which is, which, which is presented by, in that case, by publisher. And I don't get into detail in that case, just let you know that you will see, if you, if you will see the, the, the similar interfaces, just remember that this part related to, to reactive programming. All right, if we analyze, for example, that code, we will, we will see that the only change, the only difference with the default, this is the most common technique of building web application is the presence of reactive types, and that's it. Okay, so far so good? Cool, let's go forward. And let's apply the changes. So I would like to start with moving our application to first new reactive web, Webflux project. And I believe you are a lazy audience, and I am a lazy developer. I don't like to code anything during the demo session. That's why I will switch between the commits, and we will try to, and we will suppose to move from one point to another point, and in time, like, we will jump into the end of the sprint and analyze what, what we did during the, during the sprint. So I will apply our changes and show you the difference that we did during our migration. First of all, the first changes is migrate, migration from Spring Boot 1.5 to new Spring Boot 2.x. Without that migration, we can't use new Spring Webflux project. You have to remember that. In turn, another changes is just providing an additional dependency to new Spring Web Flux, Spring Boot Starter Web Flux, and that's it. Along with that, we have some changes in API, just small changes in, in, in API, and we have to fix it. And that's only small changes, and small incompatibility is changes in, in API of Spring Data. So we have to, ch to change just only one method, and that's it. As you may see, not so much changes in that in that project, right? Also, if we run, if we rebuild our application and we run it, we will see that it just work. Just a moment, the project is compiling. Yeah, and here we are. Also, we have to run our database. And yeah, here we are. We updated to new Spring Boot version. We may start chatting, and you will see some new messages on the screen. So our application after, the, after migration to new Spring Boot and new Spring Web Flux are still working, which is fine, which is fine for, from the business perspective, and which is fine from the manage, management perspective and from, from the develop, development perspective. Cool. Let's move forward. We did some changes in our project. So let's summarize how, what we have to, 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 to do to be reactive. First of all, we have to move to new Spring Web Flux project. Also, we have to rely on new Reactor 3. We will further, you, and you will see further in that presentation how to use Reactor uh, and build reactive asynchronous non-blocking code. In turn, we have to change only just a few lines of, 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 of our code to become new, to, to, go, to get new reactive application and to, to move to new reactive stuff. And finally, we have to just a small, few small incompletion in our project, which we have to fix, which is amazing because we don't have to move to rebuild any, everything in our project. We just have to change few things in the code and that's it. Cool, but that's, that's not enough to be, to be reactive. We have to change our application from the scratch. As you remember, we have to move from push, from pull, pull in 
to push, but it's hard. To move to push communication, we have to rebuild anything, and which is, which is, which is impossible in, in real development. That's why we, we will try to move step by step and move our application step by step to the new reactive stuff. And first step is changing communication between our client and our server. We will try to change communication from pooling between client to server to push. So how do we do that? Let's try to analyze what we have right now. Right now we have something like this. We have a pooling on each pooling mechanism on each client which call to our server and send almost similar request and receive almost similar response. That's a pure wasting of the resource because each client calls and sends almost a similar request and receive almost a similar response. So instead of sending the similar request, sending the similar and receiving the similar response, you may move pooling pooling functionality to our server and create server-side pooling. And instead of pooling messages, new messages from the client perspective, you may push the, those changes to the client and client may react to the changes. So we may create some pushing API, some, some via some continuous connection between client and server and server will be responsible for pushing messages from the server to client. And the question is how to achieve that functionality. This is really simple. We may rely on server sent events, which is standardized by part of HTML5. And migration to that, to that new capabilities is really simple. I will show you. In turn, from the server side perspective, we may rely on new reactor functionality, which allows us easily multiplexing events and caching events with with no headache. In turn, to build pooling API, building pooling functionality, we have to use some reactor API and we will be able to, be, to build really amazing and efficient pooling mechanism. That's what we will do in the next code session and I will show it. I will apply the new bunch of changes and we will go through it. First of all, here we have a bit more changes. First of all, we have some changes from the JavaScript perspective. I am not a JavaScript developer and front-end developer, but I, will, I were, were able to move that code from pooling mechanism to push mechanism without any additional changes. As you may see, we have to change just a few lines of code to move from pooling to push mechanism. And the base, the base logic of the front, from the per front end perspective were, is, is, is unchanged, which is amazing. In turn, from the server perspective, we have to change only two files. We have to update our mechanism of sending data at the first, on the first request. Here we remove redundant call for new messages on each request. And in, from the REST API perspective, what we have to do is a bit change our communication from imperative to reactive. And here we have to apply some, some changes. I will show it in a, in a moment. Let me do that. So here we apply some technique from reactor. We rely on some real reply processor, which, is, which allow us multiplex an event and caching it. And here we use some flux sync, which is a way to supply events to the stream, manually supply events to the stream. And here is the code responsible for creating pooling mechanism. I will explain it in a moment. I, I believe it's unclear for now. Who think it's unclear for now? Just raise your hand. Yeah, there is some people who do not understand what is going on, but that's fine. It's a new, it's a new stuff. It's, we have to learn it, but from the pooling mechanism perspective, we have almost similar as we, have, as we had before. Like, we have the similar pooling as we did it before, and we have the similar way of updating statistics, and just new fancy stuff from Reactor. If you look on our presentation and try to analyze what is going on behind the scene, we will see that this code builds something like depicted on, on the slide. So when we receive the first changes, for example, we will receive the new cursor ID. 
we will delay that, that element because we would like to repeat our action, for example, one per second. Then when the message will be delivered to the next part of our code, we will start pulling. We will start pulling new events. We will start asking Jitter for new events. And eventually, we will get successful response. And based on that, we will send new messages to our reply processor, which will cache all events in, in, in the storage. It'll, in turn, by calling, by manually calling flux scene and cursor sync, we will manually send new event, asynchronously and blockingly send new event to the pooling mechanism again, and we will start a new iteration of pooling, which might, for example, which might be unsuccessful as depicted in that case. For example, we, this external service is unavailable. In that case, we will fail. We will got a failure. Nevertheless, we will have a retry mechanism, which is part of reactor. We will easily may retry new actions by calling just by applying just one operator in place, and that operator will retry the action again, and eventually we will be successful again and get new messages. And I will show you that in that case our application is a bit reliable than in a previous case. So I will try to stop the database and I will try to disconnect from the from the network, and you will see that. Our application, now I have to restart it first. Obviously, I have to restart it first. Come on. Yeah, here we are. I have to connect to the network first, and I have to run the database first. Then I have to update my page. Yeah, here we have some messages. And right after that, I will disable my network connection. See it? It's disabled right now. And I will restart the application, and all messages will be returned. And if I open new window, the new client, of course, we, have, we don't have a JavaScript, downloaded JavaScript here. But despite the fact, we will be able to receive new messages. And if we chat, if we write, if we write some messages right now, on my phone, and then enable the network, those messages will be delivered automatically to our server in a couple of minutes, uh, moments. Come on. <laughs> Send it, please. Maybe I have to. Okay, that's the demo effect. Yeah, here we received the messages, amazing. So without any additional effort from our side, we, will, we, will be able to, we, will, we are able to receive the messages and recover from the failure, which is amazing. Just by applying a few lines of code. Okay, let's move further and let's analyze. No, let's back to, that's the wrong slide, yeah. And let's summarize and let's see what is going on further. When the client connects to our server, it receives the, f the, the last cache of messages from the reply processor. And those messages will be easily merged to the push, push wire and push connection and will be pushed to the server without any additional effort. And in that case, our client will be isolated from the any additional, any external parts. Okay, that's cool. Let's summarize what we did right now. First of all, we improved the resource usage because instead of pulling messages from the client, we move our pulling mechanism to the server. And by doing just one thing, we were able to optimize significantly our performance. In turn, the caching is is achievable without any additional effort just by using new reactor stuff and new reactor operators. Finally, we may easily multiplex in events. We don't have to care about any subscribers who subscribe to our, to our server. We may easily manage all subscribers just by using reactor API and new Spring Web Flux stuff. And finally, 
we may enable responsiveness of our application just by applying a few lines of code. And I will show you that, that line of code, that's, that's lines of code again. So first of all, by applying timeout, we will be, we will be able to time out the, to, to, to limit the waiting time for external calls. So we will be able to, to react on some failures as soon as possible. And then we will be able to restart calling the pooling again on failures. Just two lines of code to enable that, that big functionality. All right, let's move further. It's cool that we apply some and we got some fancy stuff, but that's not enough. First of all, it's not enough because we have blocking communication with external services and we have to remove it. Our application should rely on non-blocking communication. So what we have to do to move from blocking synchronous to com communication to non-blocking asynchronous. First of all, we have to change our mindset and we have to change our API from imperative synchronous to imperative to asyn reactive asynchronous. For example, we have to move our object communication or return type of object to mono of object. Or if we have some collection like iterable or list, we have to move that iterable collection to flux of elements. However, there is some exclusion from that rule. For example, when we, we, when we are moving from, from pulling to pushing, we have to change objects to stream of objects because we change our pulling mechanism to stream of natural stream of changes. We will see it later, but you, you have to know it and remember about that. What else? In turn, we have to change our communication with external services. We have to move from blocking synchronous communication with the database to non-blocking and asynchronous communication using reactive crowd repository. And if you look inside the reactive crowd repository, we will see that everything is built on top of asynchronous, non-blocking communication using reactor. Moreover, we have to change our communication with external services. And usually for communication with external services, we rely on REST and play. By the way, who use in, 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 in the project REST and play for communication with external services? Cool, amazing. So to change REST and play, new web flux offers us new web client, which is purely asynchronous and non-blocking client, web client, and again, it relies on reactor communication. So we have end-to-end -end support for asynchronous non-blocking communication user reactor. So let's see, let's apply those changes in our project. And let's do the second iteration. Let's, let's do the second sprint of, of development like we do in, in, in real life. And here we have a bunch of changes. But first of all, I would like emphasize and show you that moving to new asynchronous communication is easy. For example, what we have to do to move our communication with database from synchronous blocking to asynchronous, we, all we have to do is just change in one Monho repository to reactive Monho repository, and that's it. In turn, even if we have some additional stuff, some, some custom communication with Monho, like in that case, here we have some mechanism on, of retrie retrieving the most active and the most popular user in this chat room, which relies on Monho operations, which is part of Sprint, Sprint data. And we have some query here. All we have to do in to, to move that part of complex querying from synchronous blocking to asynchronous, we just have to change Monho operation to reactive Monho operation. And we, ha we just have to change our optional blocking API to our asynchronous non-blocking based on mono, and that's it. Just a few lines, just eight differences as you may see. That's cool. I love it. In turn, from the communication perspective with external services, which is communication with Gitter, we have to change a bit more, of course, because it's absolutely different API in terms of communication. Here we have our REST and play, and here, we have new web client. And we, again, have to change a few lines of code to move from blocking synchronous communication, which, were, which, which is here on the left side, to new asynchronous non-blocking. 
based on monos and fluxes. All right, what else do we, ha what do we have to, to change? First of all, we have to change a bit of our mechanism of pooling, pooling mechanism. We have to change, we have to move from synchronous communication to a synchronous one. And we have to change some communication, these external services. We have to apply some technique from working with reactor for building the code using reactor. But that's fine. That's not so much changes. And if we restart our application again, which we will do right now, which we are doing right now, we will see that it works. First of all, it's important, it just works. And if we restart our application, come on, we will see the messages again. And if I write something on the screen, we will receive that messages, which is amazing. So our application just works, that's fine, but that's not enough. That's not enough because we have polling mechanism, but let's summarize what we did just during that session. First of all, we got reactivity, asynchronous and non-blocking communication end to end in the application. We just rely on the new Spring Web Flux functionality to receive new asynchronous non-blocking stuff. In turn, migration is pretty smooth. We don't have to change a lot in our application and we will be able to move our application and you will be able to move your application, your production ready application just in one sprint from synchronous blocking based communication to asynchronous and non-blocking using just new sprint fancy stuff. And that's cool. But our main mission is achieving purely reactive application, the stream of changes to which we will be re to which our application will react. That's why we have to push, push messages from the really very source to the very end of our application. And we have to move our communication from pooling to push mechanism. What we have to do to, to achieve that functionality? First of all, we have to apply, we have to use some features of Reactor API. We have to move from pooling REST communication from the server to server perspective to pushing communication. And fortunately, Jitter offers us Jitter push API, which allow us receiving, connecting to the Gitter once and listening to all the changes in particular room. So let's apply it. Let's move to the changes again. And here we are. What do we have here? First of all, I'll show you. First of all, from the communication with Jitter, we have to add additional endpoint and additional method. We have to use some streaming API, some streaming endpoint, as you may see here, to, to call it and then wire some continuous connection with Gitter service, which will send and push events from Gitter to our server and then from our server to the client. In turn, we keep code related to pulling the first bench of the, the first list of messages at the very beginning and change it. From the statistic server perspective, we have to move from pulling mechanism to pure push mechanism. So earlier, we had here just mono and we move from mono because it's one element to the stream of elements and that's a good example of moving from pulling mechanism to push. So in that case, we just send a stream of messages to our statistic service, which sends in turn all the messages to MongoDB, and then we will react on the changes in MongoDB and recalculate the statistic based on that. That's the main, the main functionality that has changed it. In turn, from the REST API perspective, we have to change our communication as well. We have to build a pure stream of messages. Here, by applying one merge sequen sequential operator or main merge operator, we will be able to merge all messages from first pull requests, so from first request to G chat service, to Gitter service, and then merge it with all messages, all continuous and infinitive messages from the connection with Gitter. In turn, we have some 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 
fancy stuff from Reactor, which I will explain in a few minutes. But if you start our application, and I hope we did it. Come on. Yeah, here we are. If you start our application, you will see that it just works. You will try to write some messages. Yeah, here we have some messages. And now I will try to turn off all, all external communication with, with external services. I will turn off my database. I will turn off the, the wired connection with Wi-Fi. And my application will be still available. In turn, if I got or restart the, 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 the connection with the network, and the Gitter service become available, and I'll start messages, messaging new services, new messages, you will see that messages become, start appearing on the screen without enabled database. As you may see, database is still unavailable. Even if I restart my application from the scratch, so the database is still unavailable. and reload my application, we, will sti we still will be able to receive some messages, even if statistic is unavailable. And once we enable the database, and the or the database become available, we immediately receive all the changes from the database, and all messages will be delivered to the, to the database, and the statistic will be updated, which is amazing. We don't have to, to pay some effort to restart our servers to manage some operational or ask some operation or personal to restart our application to receive to, to, to recover from the failure. We just have to apply a few techniques from the reactor API to receive amazing responsive application. So let's analyze what is going on behind the scene. The most important part of the code is depicted on the screen and it builds the following execution flow. When we connect to the external Gitter API using the client, we will start two separate connections simultaneously. And the first one will send messages first, and that messages will be published. Then we will go back to the publish operator a bit later. After, after that action, the connection will be disconnected. And we will have only one connection, one continuous con connection with streaming API which eventually will send some new messages, some new updates, which will be published. Why do we have here publish operator? Publish operator is responsible to split the stream of the messages on two separate independence flow. And one flow will, will be immediately send messages to the client, or in that case to reply processor. And another part, another stream will be sent, will be connected to the database and will send all the changes and all messages separately isolated to new to uh, MongoDB and all messages will be stored here independently with with the changes in 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 the separate flow and based on that we will be able to isolate our components independently because we in previous case we rely on on cursor which which is we, we, and we, will, we were, respons we, we were uh, responsible for updating the cor cursor state. That's why we have to keep couplet two components. In, this, in that case, we don't have to care about cursor. We don't have to care about updating pulling mechanism because pulling mechanism may, may sit in the Gitter API or somewhere else. We build just a streaming API. We just pass messages through our system. And that's why we, we are able to isolate our components easily in that case. Finally, if you look from the high perspective on our application, you will see that we were built the purely streaming application. And all messages starting from the Gitter just passing through our system naturally, asynchronously, non-blockingly. And that's a pure choreography of events which are sent from the Gitter to our clients. Finally, we have to, to, to move from our not, not super cool 
web server, which is Tomcat in that case, and I will show that we, will, we, we have in, in that case Tomcat server. So let me show it. Uh, yeah, right now our application is still built on top of some non-efficient non communication using between client and server using Tomcat. And we have to change it of, as well. Why we have to change it? Because we may, we may do it better. You may rely on more efficient server, like Netty server, which is a synchronous, even driven framework. So what's cool in, in, in Netty? First of all, the most cool part of the Netty is a pure asynchronous non-blocking server, which allows us asynchronous, asynchronous non-blocking passing event through our system. In turn, Netty relies on, so on something called event loop. And by using these two parts, we will be able to super improve super, to receive super high throughput of, uh, in our system. And we will be able to get really efficient resource utilization. Right? That statement is really true because I did some, some measurement and I may say for sure that for some cases, one native may replace two Tomcats. And by doing that, by changing your server mechanism from Tomcat to Net, you'll be able to reduce your spans on the on the service or on the client on, or on the client provi called provider on two times. So you, you will be able to reduce your budget for on servers really, really, really significantly. So let's do it. To move to ser to to Net to server, we, we we have to change only one dependency. First of all, we have to remove our Spring Boot Starter web, which is direct, directly say and says, says out to our Spring, uh, Spring Boot applications that our server should rely on Tomcat and Spring Web MVC. And by removing that, we directly say that we have to move from Tomcat to Netty. Only one changes to move to Netty. And by applying the changes and restarting our application, We will see that our server, uh, yeah, here we have Netty. And yeah, right now our server engine is Netty. And if we restart our application, we will see that it just works. And we will receive much higher and more efficient resource utilization and higher throughput. All right. Let's try to check, check out. First of all, our main mission of the presentation was achieving the diagram. And let's try to check whether we are here. First of all, by applying new reactor API and new web flags, we were able to receive resilience. And I showed it, I showed it to you. We were able to disconnect all external services and then easily recover from the failure and without any additional effort and without restarting the whole application and the whole system. In turn, using Reactor, we, we are able to move to message-driven communication or message passing, a synchronous message passing between our components. And finally, that gives us a responsive application which always responds to user's request because and responsive is the main value of any business and we are building responsive application because responsiveness is the main value of the business. However, there is some gap in our system. Unfortunately, our system in that case, in that example, isn't elastic or isn't scalable. However, we may apply some additional model in our system like Sprint Cloud Streams, and by applying just one model, we will be able to scale our application in the cloud. But that's a different story. If you are interested and if you are curious about how to achieve such kind of system using Sprint Cloud, I am encourage you to talk about that backstage, but that will be later. Let's, let's summarize our talk. What we have take away from, from this speech? First of all, you may achieve a synchronous non-blocking communication using Project Reactor. In turn, using some fancy Reactor stuff, we will be able to easily multiplex and cache events 
using reply processor, for example. Moreover, we may easily receive and achieve resilience and isolation of components from external system by applying just two simple operators of reactor, just like timeout and retry. Finally, we have to change our mindset and we have to move our application from blocking synchronous and imperative communication to asynchronous non-blocking and move off our imperative types to reactive types like Mono and Flux. In turn, we have to change our communication with database. We have to move from play imperative synchronous communication with database over crowd repository to reactive crowd repository. For communication with external services, we have to move from REST on play to web client. And finally, we have to move from Spring WebMVC to new Spring Web Flux. And of course, we have to change our Tomcat to Netty. And Netty is really powerful and efficient server. What disadvantages of, of that technique? First of all, it's hard to understand. And I believe a lot of people are still disappointed in what is, what is, what, 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 what is going on here. Raise your hand is, if something is unclear. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> then we will talk about that. I will try to help you and explain some stuff. In turn, sometimes we have to rewrite our code from scratch. For example, a good example of rewriting everything from scratch was with REST template. And we have to apply and use new web client and their new API. In turn, and unfortunately, we don't have reactive JDBC driver, and that's a really big problem because most of the application and most of the new modern system relies on JDBC and uh, relational database. And currently, that's a problem, but Oracle works on that. And I hope in five years or maybe 10, we will have a synchronous non-blocking driver. And of course, debugging of asynchronous and non-blocking code is really challenge. But in contrast, we have a huge amount of advantages. First of all, by applying such steps and such refactoring in your product production ready application, you will be able to achieve really reactive system just with Spring Framework. And we have all fancy stuff from Spring Framework because it's Spring Framework. In turn, we will get two or three times higher throughput in our system by applying those advices. In turn, we'll get more efficient utilization of the resources. So we'll be able to reduce the amount of, of, of cloud instances in our system. And finally, we will build reactive system by applying those techniques. So I believe you are curious about how to be reactive. And you are thinking how to start being reactive and what, what we have to read first. First of all, I'm, I suggest to start your reading and start your reactive journey with reading that book. That's a really small book which explains why your application should be reactive. And it explains the most fundamental parts of reactive system. In turn, after that, I'm suggesting you to read some 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 documents of Webflux and play with Webflux framework in that in the following link and in the following in the following um, in the following workshop. In turn, Webflux is built on top of Reactor, and Reactor is the core of our application. Using Reactor, we will be able to build new asynchronous communication and write our code in new reactive, asynchronous, and non-blocking way. So that's a different programming model, and I suggest you to play a bit with Reactor and learn new operators and new fancy stuff of Reactor. Finally, if you're still aware if, and you still worry about new reactive hype, I suggest you to read the blog of Netflix and new, blogs, new blog post of Netflix, because Netflix is purely an end-to-end -end reactive Reactive, um, reactive company. So they have a lot of story of failure and success with reactivity, and I'm, suggest you to, I'm suggesting you to read something interesting from their blog. Finally, thank you. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your willingness to learn something new about reactivity and 
all the code and all the presentation is available in the following links. And thank you. And if you have some questions, you are welcome.